Welcome back to the second session for the evening. Over the last couple of years, there has been a pronounced emphasis on ESG and robust governance practices in India, especially on the back of the decline and failures of some large corporations being credited to poor governance practices. To talk to us about this new focus on ESG in corporate India, we are honored to have with us Dr. Mukund Kovind Rajan, who is the chairman of eCube Investment Advisors. This session will be moderated by Mr. Vidhu Shekhar. Vidhu is the country head of CFA Institute in India. He is responsible for advancing the mission of CFA Institute and supporting CFA charter holders in India. Vidhu is a seasoned financial and investment professional with over 30 years of industry experience in India and abroad. Previously, he was vice president, new products and business excellence, National Stock Exchange of India, overseeing new product initiatives in debt and equity markets. He also contributed to the development of Indian financial markets through his participation in the work of various committees, including the Dr. Patil Committee on Corporate Bonds and Securitization, the Raghuram Rajan Committee on Financial Sector Reforms, and the most recent being Primary Market Advisory Committee at SEBI. Prior to that, Mr. Shekhar served as Senior Vice President at IDPI Capital Markets and Managing Director at E-Trade Systems India Limited. Mr. Shekhar completed his postgraduate diploma and management from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad in 1987 and holds a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Delhi. Welcome, Vidhu. Over to you now. Thank you, Shagun. Thank you very much. And welcome from my side to the conference, everybody who is attending. Uh, it is my honor today to uh, introduce Dr. Mukund Rajan and to moderate your session. But uh, before I do so, I must congratulate uh, the Pune chapter for hosting this conference. And I do this for a specific reason, because uh, Pune has picked uh, the important and difficult uh, topic of corporate governance uh, at a time when our other chapters are picking sexier topics like fintech or value investing or wealth management. So congratulations, Pune. Uh, you know, you have taken up the cudgels of uh, bringing to the attention of our membership and to the larger investment community something which is most important for long-term value creation and uh, to uh, and beyond that to uh, uh, you know our very survival um, you know in long-term success uh, in the corporate world the title of dr rajan's talk today is corporate india and the new focus on esg in this talk he is going to cover the broad context in which esg investing is becoming more important for corporate india and how uh, the corporate world is responding to the changing needs of its stakeholders. We could not have picked a better person to speak on this topic as Dr. Rajan, after having worked at Tata for uh, more than two decades, decided to set up an ESG fund called eCube Investments. He is the chairman of eCube Investment Advisors, a platform created in 2019 to catalyze environment, social and governance related changes in corporate India. Prior to this, he held a number of senior executive positions through his 23-year career with the Tata Group, including Chief Ethics Officer of the Tata Group, the first brand custodian of the Tata Group, Head of the Foreign Offices of Tata Sons, Chair of the Tata Global Sustainability Council, Member of the Group Executive Council at Tata Sons, Head of Private Equity at Tata Capital, and Managing Director of one of the group's listed telecom businesses. He has also served on the boards of various Tata companies. Dr. Rajan currently serves as the chairperson of the Environment Committee of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FIKI, and is a member of the Council of Management of the Forum for Free Enterprise. He has previously served as the chair of India at 75 Council of the CII and chair of CII Core Group on China. In 2007, the World Economic Forum honored Dr. Rajan as a young global leader. He was also part of the inaugural class of the CII Aspen Institute India Leadership Initiative. Dr. Rajan graduated from the Bachelor of Technology program at the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Delhi, in 1989. He received a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford University, where he completed a master's and doctorate in international relations. His doctoral dissertation titled Global Environmental Politics, India and the North-South Politics of Global Environmental Issues was published by Oxford University Press in 1996, and the second book, The Brand Custodian, was published by HarperCollins in 2019. Welcome, Dr. Rajan. 
Thank you so much, uh, Vidhu. Really appreciate uh, your having me uh, on this conference. And good evening, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege for me to address the CFA Society today. Uh, what I want to share over the next 40 odd minutes, over 20 odd slides, is the impact of the new focus on ESG or environment, social, and governance on corporate India. As most of you would be aware, the E in ESG encapsulates the natural resources a business consumes, the pollution it creates, the carbon emissions it generates, and many other environmental impacts. The S refers to the links and ties a business develops with the local community, the way it treats its own people, its focus on diversity and inclusion, and its reputation as a trusted partner to stakeholders. And G, of course, uh, deals with how a business is governed, which includes board effectiveness protocols, audit controls, approach to senior executive compensation, and appropriate reliance on independent directors. All of these ESG issues critically influence the sustainability of businesses and the basis on which key decisions linked with the sustainable growth of businesses can be taken. So uh, in my presentation, the first part, I will cover the broad context, both domestic and international, in which ESG investing is becoming important for corporate India. And in the second part, cover what Indian businesses might do to respond to stakeholder expectations. Could we turn to slide two, please? So we are, of course, in the midst of a global pandemic, which has already seen over 57 million people worldwide being infected with the coronavirus with over 1.3 million deaths. The economic consequences, as we are all seeing, have been grave with declining customer demand, supply chain disruption, increased unemployment, economic recession, and increased uncertainty. These impacts have been linked in some measure to the excessive short-termism of many corporates, including in India. A number of businesses have been exposed as having limited financial reserves with an inability to sustain overheads beyond a few weeks. Values many in the corporate sector profess have also come under scrutiny for their treatment of key stakeholder groups like employees and workers, particularly their decisions to cut jobs and dismiss casual labor. We saw the migrant labor tragedy play out before our eyes earlier this year. How corporate India is responding to the pandemic offers insights into the ways in which other crises might be tackled, and perhaps none more imminent than the threats posed by global warming. With India's long coastlines, our country is likely to be greatly impacted by sea level rise. Rising temperatures will make outdoor work more difficult. Unpredictable changes in precipitation and weather patterns will particularly impact Indian agriculture and more natural disasters are likely to add to human misery in our country. All this will greatly test the resilience of corporate India. Stakeholders are likely to be less forgiving the next time around if businesses find themselves unprepared to meet the challenges of the next set of crises. We move to the next slide. In truth, there is already considerable skepticism that many stakeholders have about the capabilities of many Indian companies to build sustainable, profitable businesses. You only have to look at the volume of cases brought under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code to the National Company Law Tribunal, over 10,000 and counting, and their linked impact in the rising non-performing assets in the Indian banking system. A big reason for India's economic underperformance to understand why there is such skepticism. The trust deficit in the banking system ultimately impacts the risks that lenders are willing to take and keeps interest rates higher than they need to be for much of corporate India. A particular concern is the number of industry leaders who have failed to sustain their operations. Think of Jet Airways in aviation, Reliance Communications in telecoms, SR in steel, Videocon and consumer electronics. And beyond just failed strategies, the concern is that too many companies have suffered from exceptionally weak corporate governance. 
This is reflected in the many civil and criminal cases lodged against Indian corporate leaders. I don't have to name them. There are a number of them, including those who are now overseas, trying to elude the long arm of Indian law. Could we move to the next slide, please? The corporate governance crisis is amplified by stakeholder concerns about corporate conduct, which has adversely impacted India's natural environment. For far too long, Indian businesses have been able to shelter behind a view which was first made famous by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in her seminal speech at the Stockholm Conference of 1972, that developing countries like India must give priority to addressing serious developmental challenges before more substantially devoting their attention to environmental protection. Hence, for instance, the recent quote that you see from Chandra Bhushan of the Center for Science and Environment on the slide. Could we move to the next slide, please? The economic activity of corporate India has unfortunately yielded some of the worst environmental indicators in the world. Sample these data points. 21 of the 30 most polluted cities in the world in terms of air pollution are in India. Of India's land mass of 328 million hectares, just under half, around 147 million hectares, is undergoing some form of degradation due to deforestation, drought, and improper or inappropriate agricultural practices. And 21 of India's largest cities are projected to run out of groundwater this year, affecting over 100 million people. The next slide, please. The tide, however, I believe is turning, with key contributions being made by growing public awareness and concern and judicial activism. A good example of this is provided by what is playing out in the national capital region, particularly in the winter months when air pollution levels become quite dangerous. Businesses get adversely impacted by multiple actions taken by the authorities, case in point being the odd even traffic rules to reduce vehicular traffic or the temporary bans on diesel genset operation, the bans on construction and demolition activities, and indeed recently during Diwali, the ban on the use of firecrackers. Judicial pronouncements are also becoming more aggressive, as you can see from the quote on the slide, from the Madras High Court's judgment on the case relating to Sterlite Copper's unit in Chutikorin. Could we change the slide, please? Rising environmental concerns in India also mirror growing concerns around the world about global environmental issues. These are issues that impact the whole world. No single country can on its own successfully address them. So cooperation between nations is a must. Examples of such issues, these include ozone depletion, the loss of biodiversity, but perhaps today, the most pressing concerns are around global warming and climate change. So 2018 was a turning point in the discourse on climate change. The expert report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was released the same year made ominous projections of global warming that exceeded all earlier forecasts. It recommended going significantly beyond the Paris Climate Treaty target, which was trying to deal with a two degree rise in global temperature by the turn of the century to instead target a 1.5 degree rise. And this is going to call for far more aggressive and difficult economic transformation. Growing public concern has also impacted politics around the world, reflected, for instance, in the recent surge of the Green parties in the European Union. Citizen movements have also evolved. Think of the impact that Greta Thunberg, for instance, has had. In all of this, India is key to how the world will resolve the problem of global warming. It is already the third largest greenhouse gas producer in the world after China and the United States. And on an incremental basis, may well add the largest stock of greenhouse gases this decade. It is therefore not surprising that for the first time this year, the Reserve Bank of India included some detailed commentary on climate change in its annual report. We can see a small extract of that on the slide. Could we go to the next slide, please? 
There is also a broader international context within which the environmental crisis is getting navigated. So ever since the Brundtland Commission's 1987 report, titled Our Common Future, there has been a focus on how the international community needs to come together to address critical questions around sustainable development. And this has acquired greater momentum as a result of the explosion of international trade over the last 25 years. And thanks to the growth in international travel and the advent of the World Wide Web, communities and markets across the globe are now more informed and more interconnected than ever before in human history. And of course, social media platforms, which we all use, like Facebook and Twitter, have seen their subscriber bases dramatically expand. And their influence is what, for instance, allowed a phenomenon like the hashtag MeToo movement to go viral. Let me go to the next slide, please. So with far greater international interconnectedness, multiple stakeholders beyond domestic borders are now capable of influencing the domestic agenda of corporate India. On an issue like climate change, we should expect that foreign governments, besides introducing new rules and regulations, will also leverage tariff and non-tariff international trade barriers, as well as international aid to push Indian companies to improve their environmental compliance. Meanwhile, customers across the globe are increasingly demonstrating a preference to embrace brands that have a societal purpose and that show empathy for the challenges local communities may face. I can share an example of the influence customers can wield from the time when I was in the Tata Group. So in 2014, the Tetley brand found itself at the receiving end of the public ire of customers and civil society groups around the world for the poor living conditions in plantations from which it sourced tea. Several young girls from these plantations had in fact become victims of human trafficking. Calls to consumers to therefore boycott Tetley tea began to gather momentum. And it was only after detailed clarifications were provided by the parent company, Tata Global Beverages, on its commitment to create a thriving, socially fair and environmentally sustainable tea industry, along with a promise to audit and transparently address working and living conditions in the tea plantations that the pressure on the company eventually eased. Global stakeholder concerns are also often mediated not through one government or another, but through the United Nations. An important impact on Indian corporates emanates from the framework for sustainability management developed by the UN in the form of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. There are 17 SDGs traversing issues ranging from poverty alleviation to addressing climate change, in turn translating into 169 targets that the international community would like to see achieved by 2030. Now, what these SDGs have done is to essentially fuse the global with the local, and they've created an interest for the international community in the way in which local issues are now being addressed within countries. There will therefore be a much closer look in the future at how Indian businesses are playing a supportive role in delivering India's SDG targets. Could we move to the next slide? So in an interconnected world with global supply chains, clearly Indian companies within those supply chains will need to be responsive to the expectations and risk assessment of their partners. And in this context, it is instructive to note how the corporate world's sense of global risks has evolved over the past decade. If you look at the risks identified by the members of the World Economic Forum, where in 2009 and 2010, for instance, there was only one societal risk, which was incidentally chronic disease, uh, and no environmental risk featured in the top five in terms of impact, by 2019, Four of the top five risks were related, as you can see on that table, to societal or environmental issues. Big change. We move to the next slide, please. In sync with the evolving international context in which environmental and social issues are now becoming top of mind, over 80 trillion, that's trillion with a T, 
of invested funds around the world have now subscribed to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, or the UNPRI. These principles require investors to incorporate ESG issues into their investment analysis and decision-making processes, be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into their ownership policies and practices, and seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by the entities in which they invest. A broad range of investment strategies then linked to this new focus on ESG investing. So according to the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, investors are now employing seven basic approaches, which are outlined in the slide. And you can already see all of these playing out in the Indian markets. So let me just touch on a few of these. The first one, for instance, negative or exclusionary screening is a very common approach where investors are excluding from portfolios of funds certain sectors, companies, or business practices based on ESG criteria, excluding, for instance, companies involved in, call it tobacco or alcohol. Uh, if you go down looking at ESG integration, this is another common approach where investors are systematically including ESG factors in their financial analysis. But going further down to the last uh, example of corporate engagement or shareholder action, this is an approach where investors are using shareholder power to influence corporate behavior. We're talking to senior managements and boards, filing or co-filing proposals, and undertaking proxy voting guided by ESG principles. Could we uh, go to the next slide, please? With all this focus on ESG investing and $80 trillion of funds, as I mentioned, subscribing to an ESG investing approach, the obvious question is whether this works. One of the leading academic researchers in this space is Professor George Serafim of the Harvard Business School. He has demonstrated in developed markets like the United States, the powerful correlation between material ESG actions and firm outcomes. ESG performance is correlated with better management or business model quality. A greater focus on ESG typically yields greater resource use efficiency, lower cost of operations, reduced risk and therefore reduced insurance premium, minimized regulatory and legal interventions, greater employee productivity, lower cost of borrowing, increased analyst coverage if you're in the listed space and investor interest, and therefore greater prospects for valuation re-rating. The space is, of course, uh, quite nascent in India, certainly compared to the developed markets, and yet there is already useful data available from, for instance, the MSCI India ESG Leaders Index. This index, as you can see on that table, has consistently outperformed the broader benchmark index over a one-year, three-year, five-year, and 10-year period. Could we go to the next slide, please? So, ESG investing is now informing the portfolio management strategies of large institutional investors, including pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, that typically have a long-term perspective. The European Commission has also put out regulations that require all asset managers in the European Union to disclose the ESG performance of their investment portfolios, which as we know include many Indian companies. On ESG issues like global warming, such investors are making critical decisions to divest the stocks of companies that contribute to such problems. So let me share with you, some years back in 2016, I was personally witness to the alarm created at the Tata Group when the Norwegian sovereign fund administered by Norges Bank, as part of a plan to decarbonize its portfolio, decided to divest stocks of companies that were heavily reliant or dependent on coal. So Norges Bank included in its blacklist 13 Indian companies, including Tata Power, the Tata Group's energy enterprise, which has a significant share of coal-fired thermal power in its energy mix. So it is a very real threat for Indian businesses that prove to be non-compliant on critical ESG issues, that they could face the risk of being progressively excluded from the investment portfolios of the largest fund managers in the world. From the perspective of lenders too, there is an increasing thrust on reporting of material climate-related risks in particular, 
by businesses in their financial filings. As banks and lending institutions incorporate the recommendations made by the task force on climate-related financial disclosure in their lending protocols, it will become progressively more difficult for businesses that do not evaluate and disclose the climate-related risks that they face to raise finance for their projects. In essence, uh, capital, both as equity and in the form of debt, will increasingly be allocated in the future towards well-governed companies that contribute to the goals of a more sustainable society and economy. We go to the next slide, please. The impact of the changing domestic and international context has clearly been felt in India. And you can see some of this from the evolution of regulations that impact corporate India's sustainability focus. From the voluntary guidelines on corporate social responsibility that were issued in 2009, to the national guidelines on responsible business conduct, no longer voluntary, that were issued in 2019, or from the business responsibility report mandated by SEBI for the top 100 listed companies in 2012, to the new business responsibility and sustainability report template being prepared this year, which is likely to be mandated for not the top 100, but the top 1,000 listed companies, there has been considerable movement in pushing the envelope. We move to the next slide. Regulations with a significant focus on good governance are also increasingly influencing the conduct of Indian corporates. In 2013, you had the amendments to the Indian Companies Act. These have provided for some very important changes that are on the whole beneficial to minority shareholders, including the approval of related party transactions by special resolution, class action suits, and the ability to initiate oppression and mismanagement proceedings. India has in fact been rated amongst the best countries in the world in terms of shareholder rights protection in the World Bank's Doing Business 2020 report. And of course, keeping Indian corporates on their toes are a clutch of different stakeholder groups, including proxy advisory firms and activist funds that are leveraging the new legislation press for more purposive action by Indian businesses. Meanwhile, stewardship courts have been put out by SEBI, by IRDAI and PFRDA for the entities they oversee. Institutional ownership in the Indian public equities markets is around, call it around 35% today. And the influence of major institutional investors, such as mutual funds, insurance companies, and pension funds in the Indian capital markets is increasing. If, and of course it's a big if, these investors live up to their stewardship responsibility to enhance monitoring and engagement with their investee companies, it will be very impactful in leading to improved ESG performance in corporate India. Certainly going by an indicator like the rising against votes by these investors against AGM resolutions, they are beginning to flex their muscles. Under the 2013 Companies Act amendments, mandatory rotation of auditors was also introduced, designed to improve the quality of audits and reduce the risk of auditor-client collusion. Thanks to the increased scrutiny they are now under, audit firms, I think, are choosing to resign rather than face regulatory action, particularly when they develop concerns about the veracity of financial statements and governance standards of their client companies. Uh, the number, the last number I saw was that auditors at as many as 35 listed companies chose to resign in 2019. And likewise, on the work of the rating agencies too, SEBI has got into the act, prompting the exits of several CEOs, as we know, of prominent rating agencies. And as part of a comprehensive effort to get corporate India to clean up its act, the government has tasked the newly created National Financial Reporting Authority NAFRA, to monitor audit quality of the larger firms in India. And again, we know that in its very first report, NAFRA produced a very critical commentary on the standards of accounting reflected in the books of scandal hit ILFS financial services. So with regulatory pressure and an ecosystem falling in the same direction of improved ESG performance, corporate India really needs 
to apply itself to putting in place world-class corporate governance practices. We move to the next slide. Faced with these multiple evolving regulatory expectations, what corporate India ought not to do <laughs> is to disown the need for change. And unfortunately, more often than not, what we do see is initial resistance to swift change. Uh, we have seen this in the auto industry, for instance, in the unsuccessful attempt to delay the BS4 to BS6 fuel migration, for which the industry was, I think, quite strongly ticked off by the Indian Supreme Court, or maybe a more successful pushback that took place with the Niti Aayog's recommendation of a full migration to electric two-wheelers by 2025, but one has to ask the question whether the industry has missed out in an opportunity where India could have leapfrogged the rest of the world on electric vehicles. But what both these examples highlight certainly is the need for corporate India to prepare to address many more such issues of transition risk as it adapts to a more ESG friendly world. A key challenge in my view in preparing for such transition is going to be corporate India's very modest R&D spending. According to the economic survey, the national gross expenditure on R&D in science and technology as a percentage share of the Indian GDP has been stagnant at 06 to 0.7% for the last two decades. And this is far lower compared to other BRIC nations. China, for instance, spends 2.1%, and that's on a much larger GDP base. And if you look at developed countries like Japan at 3.2%, Germany at 3%, United States at 2.8%, they all spend even more. My personal belief is that this is really Indian industry's Achilles heel. Could we move to the next slide? Assuming that corporate India is up for preparing for a more ESG friendly world, what issues must Indian businesses then focus upon? At top of the list, clearly will have to be good governance, the subject of your conference today. The boards of Indian companies must ensure their board composition reflects the industry experience they require with an appropriate complement of qualified and capable independent directors. And they must invest in the continuous education of these directors. They must ensure the boards have well-running sustainability functions with proper board oversight. And they must regularly assess their own performance and take corrective actions where due. The role of the chairman in particular is critical. And I think commentators like the previous speaker, Infosys founder, Mr. Narayan Murthy, have argued that the main source of corporate scams is often the moral weakness and incompetence of the chairman of the board in the companies where scams happen. And I certainly have considerable sympathy with that point of view. Another issue that is high on my personal priority list for embracing an ESG agenda is the adoption of a code of conduct and the nurturing of an ethical culture. Ideally, a code should speak to and be supportive of the vision, mission, and values of a company and the kind of organizational culture its leadership wishes to build. It should be approved by the company's board of directors and lay down clear compliance expectations and enforcement mechanisms. From my experience at the Tata Group, I would say that the tone at the top, frequent communication around the importance of values, deploying appropriate systems and processes, including very critically whistleblower protection, and putting in place measurement metrics are critical factors in successful deployment of a code of conduct. The next issue Indian companies need to pay attention to is linking ESG performance to executive compensation. And already you can see some fine examples, global leaders, for instance, like Pepsi, Walmart, Microsoft, Shell, are all doing exactly this. So they link the CEO's compensation targets on critical ESG issues like carbon emission reduction and workforce diversity. Turning to executive pay, this is really a proxy for how employees are valued in an organization. Senior executive pay reflects on the level of inequality that is considered acceptable within an organization and indeed society. And if it's not managed well, it can induce greed and short-termism 
as opposed to long-term sustainable commitment. So CEO pay is, uh, that's one of the reasons that CEO pay is consequently becoming a category perhaps most impacted by negative votes of minority shareholders against Indian promoters. And in fact, again, citing Mr. Narayan Murthy, I think he's weighed in on the debate on CEO pay in India, has argued that managerial remuneration has to be a fair multiple of the compensation of either the lowest level employee in a company or the median salary in a company. And this is a concept that I certainly would favor. On climate change, we've already noted the urgency for action. Uh, companies like Unilever and Nestle have already taken the lead globally in committing to effectively eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions across not just the companies, but the global supply chains by 2039 and 2050, respectively. And again, this is one space where I think corporate India, Indian companies will certainly need to adjust to these new growth pathways, but very importantly also put in place their own targets and announce their own ambitions. We go to the next slide. And so here you have an example, uh, a good example, India's largest company, Reliance Industries, seeking to really by 2035 establish net carbon zero in its operations. And I think that's a great example for the rest of corporate India. Can we move to the next slide, please? Beyond the specific issue of climate change, Indian companies are also going to need to focus on resource use efficiency and embrace circular economy practices that minimize waste across product life cycles and that prioritize better design for reuse, repair and recycling of waste. And this is also incidentally throwing up many new opportunities for companies across segments. Think about energy optimization, the whole electric vehicle ecosystem, the internet of things, and indeed the sharing economy. Indian companies will also need to establish far greater diversity within their workforces. And there are two specific areas of focus that I would like to call out. One is of course, uh, something I think we would all agree on, which is gender. On gender parameters, India as a nation ranks very poorly. We are 120th out of 131 nations, according to one World Bank report, with one of the lowest levels of female participation in the workforce anywhere in the world. And by not making women as welcome in the workforce as many other nations, India, I think, misses out on their income generation capabilities, which could significantly increase our GDP as a nation, but perhaps more importantly, by denying many women the opportunity to be independent and to enjoy the self-esteem and confidence that comes from earning for themselves, I think this is really at the root of many social evils in India. The second area of diversity failure is the poor absorption of representatives of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities in Indian workforces. And I think there is a real possibility that a future government in the not very distant future may choose the route of legislating reservation for these communities in the private sector if the absorption numbers do not improve. On the point about employee engagement, a number of Gallup and other studies have shown the strong correlation between a focus on employee engagement and better customer engagement, higher productivity, better retention, fewer accidents at the workplace, better health outcomes, and higher profitability. And I think Indian companies have a particularly valuable tool to strengthen employee engagement. And this is really their commitment on CSR spending. So you can use CSR spending obligations in whatever way to reinforce the connect that your employees have with the company's mission constructed around a set of shared ESG focused values. Closely linked with employee engagement is the issue of treatment of labor. As I mentioned at the start, the values of many companies were put on test during the pandemic when viewed through the lens of the treatment of labor, particularly migrant labor. Corporate India needs to demonstrate a greater social conscience in this area. And it's worth noting that even today, a number of India's top 100 listed companies, India's biggest and best, you would hope, 
do not actually have policies on human rights or the use of child labor in their supply chains, and do not even have policies on creating disabled friendly workspaces for their own employees. Turning to land acquisition, this has always been an emotive issue in India. Over the years, many development oriented projects have met with strong community resistance. So think of the Tata Motors project in Singur or Vedanta's bauxite mining plans in Niamgiri. To be a neighbor of choice in all cases of land acquisition, corporate India must work with the government to ensure the benefits of economic expansion are fairly distributed within the local communities. And the final issue I thought I would touch upon is the issue of corruption. I think even this morning you saw a big headline in the newspapers. Uh, the fact is India features a lowly 80th in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index uh, for 2019. India's poor record on contract enforcement certainly is one reason for the existence of corruption. But in any act of corruption, there is an issue of supply and demand. And corporate India must at least address the supply side of the equation. So it's good that SEBI is placing more responsibility on the shoulders of board directors, especially independent board directors, to oversee and monitor the behavior and ethical conduct of management. Besides this, my own sense is that as a nation, we must address the elephant in the room, and that is election funding, the fountainhead of big ticket corruption in India. The last general elections in India in 2019 reportedly saw an election spend of over 50,000 crore rupees, which is more than the amount, by the way, spent at least in 2016 in the US presidential elections. And think about it, with over 30 state elections and general elections every five years, there is a massive amount of spending on elections that takes place in India. And corporate India, willingly or otherwise, plays a major role in this exercise. To reduce the dependency on big money, many democracies have embraced reforms in political finance, such as strong disclosure norms, spending limits, and even bans on corporate donation. A common reform in many countries in recent decades has been the introduction of a system of public funding of political parties. These are all options that we must consider and that corporate India in its own interest should pursue. Move to the next slide, please. Once a company has decided how it is going to chart its ESG improvement journey, it is vitally important that it is able to measure those ESG parameters that are material to its operations and track performance over time. There are multiple reporting frameworks, including the Global Reporting Initiative or GRI, Integrated Reporting or IR, and the standards developed by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board or SASB. And recently, as you may be aware, the big four audit firms have also combined forces to try and develop a framework organized under four pillars that they've tried to align with the SDGs and with the principal ESG domain. So they call them governance, planet, people, and prosperity. While a universal framework is still elusive for Indian companies that want to improve their ESG performance, I think it's eminently feasible to take up any of the current frameworks, undertake a baselining exercise, and then consistently measure improvement over time. And thereafter, to gain credibility for the ESG efforts, I think Indian companies must be open and transparent in their communication. The business responsibility and sustainability report template will certainly offer one valuable tool in this effort. And I think it's also important for Indian companies to learn to engage responsibly with the media. And of course, they need to be careful that they do not get accused of greenwashing or window dressing. And there certainly shouldn't be any dissonance between their actions and their communication. So I'd like to end now and leave you to read the quote on screen of former Unilever chairman Paul Polman, reminding us all once again why ESG matters. Uh, could we move to the next slide, please? And with that, I am done. Thank you. You've been a very patient audience. 
uh, appreciate your time and this opportunity. Thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mukund. Uh, so you covered a lot of ground in the last uh, half an hour or so, and we have uh, many questions from our uh, audience. As you know, uh, you know the uh, CFA audience basically consists of analysts, portfolio managers, wealth advisors, uh, performance specialists, and people like that, and they are looking at they are part of the increasingly complex uh, investment industry. So, and uh, in these days, everyone's looking at ESG. Uh, but, uh, and, and before, before we get to specifics, I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about your own motivations because you started, you know, you come from this field, you did your, your doctorate is in environment, environmental politics, if I remember the from bio correctly. Yeah, not, I am interested in asking you something about the North-South divide, which continues. You you uh, you know referred to the Norges Bank issue, but uh, what is it that uh, persuaded you, uh, you know, to take up these sustainability type of responsibilities when you were at Tata, and then to eventually uh, move and set up your own fund and transition from uh, being uh, a corporate manager to an investor. And what is it that we can learn from it in terms of where the leadership comes from? Uh, because the leadership can come from uh, company management, it can come from the board, it can come from investors. Uh, if you can just uh, elaborate on that, starting from your own experience. Sure, that's a lot of ground. So uh, quiz me again if I miss out on something. <laughs> but but uh, um, you know, if I go back to my my years at um, at Oxford when I was doing my masters and doctorate. Uh, that was a time, uh, just around 1992, the Rio Earth Summit, you will remember, mm -hmm. when perhaps for the first time in several decades, we suddenly saw the global leadership across countries, across the NGO space, across the corporate uh, world coming together in Rio de Janeiro to talk about issues that impacted uh, our world. Um, I wrote a book eventually stemming from my uh, doctoral dissertation on global environmental politics. And uh, what sort of uh, surprises me is that uh, it's now almost 30 years since the Rio summit of 1992, and many of the issues remain the same. But this interest in the environment, the interest in how you solve these problems is something that has remained with me for the last three decades. And of course, in Tata, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I received a number of opportunities to represent the group. Uh, I was, uh, and I am currently the chair of the FIKI Environment Committee, I was on the CIA CSR Committee, I was nominated to uh, the Energy Transitions Commission as a commissioner. So all of these opportunities, I think, gave one the access to information, the understanding of how the world is looking at these subjects, and obviously then fueled in me a desire to try and see what one could do both at a personal level and working under the umbrella of Tata's to drive for bigger change. And then issues, as I mentioned, the Norges Bank, uh, decarbonization of the portfolio, for instance, uh, sent a very strong message to the group uh, at, I think, the right time that uh, you need to pull up your socks and you need to start thinking well into the future, not a few years, but several decades to a point of time when many of these current economic activities will become redundant or unacceptable, leaving you with stranded assets. And therefore, there's a need to plan in time. So I think all of this was sort of uh, connecting the dots with my own past background, research, and interest. And when I left the Tatas, I thought that this is an opportune moment in India's sort of corporate history to try and start creating a series of these vehicles. Uh, so I wanted to do something in the public equity space. So we've, in fact, uh, tried to do something with quantum advisors, well-known mutual fund house. We'd like to do something in the private equity space. We're currently putting together a climate finance in BFC. And going forward, I think a big opportunity, not just services, uh, particularly under the stewardship code, many of India's largest institutional investors are going to be required to really demonstrate how they are assessing their portfolio for ESG compliance. And I think the efforts of ESG uh, stewards will become very important. Overseas, for instance, entities like EOS's Hermes are, I think, doing a great job and uh, shepherding uh, tens of billions of dollars of investment thanks to their efforts. So, I think it's all coming together at the right time. For me personally, I think what I saw in India in the last few years 
two issues in particular that drove one to feel that this was the right time to do something in the ESG space. The first was obviously the huge concern around corporate governance. I think it's built up over the years, but now there's also legislation backing it, giving more power to the law enforcement agencies and also to uh, minority shareholders and investors. And the second is obviously the growing concern about extreme climatic events. Uh, I'm currently in the south of India where we've just experienced uh, a cyclone with uh, very uh, uh, significant wind speeds. These kinds of things are becoming much more common. Earlier this year, uh, in the city where I normally work, which is Mumbai, we experienced the first cyclone, um, or in the vicinity of the city, we experienced the first cyclone in many decades. These are going to become more regular and more frequent because of climate change and global warming. So I think this is the right time for corporate India to sit up, take notice, and start doing something about it. And I think all of us, uh, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, are now placing much more of a premium on what you can do with the natural environment and how you can contribute your little might to improving the circumstances and the kind of natural environment in which we live. So I think lots of things coming together and very nicely, at least for me personally, connecting a lot of the dots with what I've done in my past life. So are you seeing a coalition developing in India? Uh, because uh, you know we are, we've noticed that a lot of the initial pressure came from uh, uh, from abroad when uh, foreign investors were asking Indian companies tough questions and they had to respond. Are you seeing a similar uh, sort of awakening amongst Indian investors as well? It's beginning to happen, but it's still very early days. So yeah. there are various coalitions that are coming together. Climate change, for instance, I think two weeks back, there was the Climate uh, CEOs Forum, which the government of India helped to pull together. And they had some useful conversations with the Minister for Environment. Uh, they've made a commitment from their side and how they're going to respond and report on an annual basis the preparatory actions they're taking to deal with climate change. But a lot of this, I have to say, tends to get confined to the big corporates. So you would expect this from the Tatas, you would expect this from the Birlas, you'd expect it, uh, as we saw from the Reliance uh, Group, for instance. But I think it's the mid-market and a huge part of the small and medium enterprises community, where I think even if there is a commitment or a desire to do better, there often is a lack in terms of the wherewithal, the understanding, the technology access, and certainly the access to capital to be able to put in place the changes that are needed. And some of that is where, for instance, we at EQ are trying to address the issue of capital availability for mid-market and the MSME sector. So I think those companies need much more help. The larger companies understand what it takes to be part of global supply chains, are responding to pressures, not just from investors, but indeed from you know, the parents in their supply chains. So I think those companies have understood the importance of change, but a large part of corporate India is still, I think, beyond its remit. And I think we need to see more action, and more action that happens sooner. And even in the large corporates, uh, probably the understanding is there, but the execution still uh, has some way to go. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but at least they have the capital to be able to deploy once they figure out what is important. You've seen that in Tata Power's case. Once these early sort of warning signals came, very quickly they've pivoted. And now they're not really doing any more significant coal-based thermal power. A lot of their focus has now shifted to renewables uh, and solar and wind. So companies, I think, making the pivot swiftly. Having said that, I, I made the point in my presentation that amongst India's top 100 listed companies, there are many that today don't have policies, for instance, on issues like human rights and the use of child labor in their supply chains. So they may themselves try and run a clean ship, but the minute it goes to the tier two or tier three corporations that are part of the supply chain, they tend to turn a blind eye and that's not good either. So uh, I think there's much more that even the large corporates need to do to demonstrate they have a conscience, to demonstrate they care about these issues. And certainly on the execution side, there's a lot that still needs to be done. Okay, just uh, pivot to a slightly different issue, which was coming up in questions, is that, uh, you know, the, the perennial question that uh, the developed countries they went through a growth path which was very energy intensive 
and now you're telling the developing countries that they have to be green is that going to put a uh, uh, you know put unnecessary constraint un, uh, you know uh, uh, constraints on uh, the growth path uh, what do you think of uh, about that debate uh, whether we should be held to the same standards as the developed countries which are now pivoting and but uh, experienced uh, growth uh, you know a very energy intensive growth in the past so two three points i'd like to make uh, the first is that absolutely there is an issue of equity here why should the developing world which is in a sense catching up on development have to pay a price in terms of sacrificing possibly economic growth uh, at the altar of uh, you know green focus green consciousness when the developed countries have sort of moved so far ahead have a much better standard of living and quality of life and certainly can afford to pay for many of the interventions that are now required um having said that we have to recognize that this is a lose lose proposition uh, it's a bit like what uh, i guess gandhi uh, may have said during the partition riots uh, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind so if we refuse to do anything about these issues we are going to be amongst the biggest victims so it's not as if we have a great deal of choice to say let the rest of the world go to the dogs i am going to continue to pollute produce greenhouse gas emissions and not worry about the environmental quotient at all we don't have that choice and in indian places like delhi you are seeing that that choice is potentially killing uh, a number of people not potentially it's it is actually taking human life because of air pollution now i think what the indian government is doing is sensible it's on the one hand trying to say that look i'll make commitments including under the paris climate treaty i have nationally determined commitments by 2030 which i will fulfill and it's taking the lead in certain areas including solar for instance at least the numbers that the government has announced um you know 175 gigawatts by 2022 450 gigawatts of renewable by 2030 and anchoring the international solar alliance all these are great steps and why i like these kinds of initiatives is also because it gives india an opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world i saw this personally for instance in the years that i spent in telecoms you know india completely bypassed the fixed line roll out and moved directly to mobility and we are today after china the second largest <coughs> mobility country in the world so it is possible to leapfrog generations of effort which the developed countries have put in to get to what is the best place to be at a point of time so it is possible for india if we put our might together put our minds together to really bypass a lot of the old polluting technologies and go straight to you know the best uh, best in class best of breed technologies available today however <laughs> it also means that we've got to spend a lot on r and d and that's why i brought up the point in research and development if corporate india is going to refuse to make investments in innovation if the big corporates and they are i think the most guilty of this because we do have a thriving uh, startup community of much smaller companies but the big corporates are not i think pulling their weight in terms of spending on r and d and they are the ones who need to lead from the front and try and create larger ecosystems around them and that's why the example i gave of the auto industry uh, you know pushing back very strongly on the niti aayog suggestion that india migrate fully to electric in two wheelers by 2025 we are the world's largest two wheeler market if we took the lead in taking uh, the world forward on a technology uh, in the direction of electric we would have had to make the investments and we would have probably been ahead of the rest of the pack now by insisting that we will continue our deployment of uh, petrol engines for instance we've lost perhaps an opportunity to lead the rest of the world you probably see china or somebody else make those investments and eventually start exporting to india a bit like what you saw in mobile handset manufacture There's so much manufacturing takes place in china even though india is an equally big market and it's only now with a huge number of incentives that we're beginning to play catch up and trying to incentivize more domestic manufacture of components for mobiles so i think we need to in some cases you know have a leap of faith uh, take a bold and ambitious decision to change the technology footprint and move forward and there it's it's a potential big win that the country could have it's not just about being compliant with what the developed world wants but it's about seeing opportunity and trying to actually get ahead of the rest of the world in, in some of these spaces and we certainly have the intellect and the capability to do that
Right. So, in fact, uh, you know, you mentioned smaller companies and the challenges they face, but uh, there is also the opportunity for innovation. They are more nimble. So, uh, if you create the right ecosystem, if you provide the right support, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that, uh, you know, you could see transformative change coming from uh, medium sized and small sized companies as well. And maybe that is something that we should be uh, examining more. Now, there is another set of questions that I have got. Uh, you know, you uh, I, a lot of the people in the audience are analysts, and uh, you know, during their CFA uh, you know program and uh, afterwards, they uh, go through a lot of systematic uh, you know training on how to do financial analysis, right? Forecasting models, this, that, and so on. But uh, you know, we do cover uh, ESG issues uh, in a general, generic sort of way. But uh, what can you do to you know, in terms of uh, ESG integration into your uh, company analysis and valuation and so on. Do you follow any specific framework? Do you have any advice or do you have even any general advice about how to get up on that curve as to become a good analyst who can understand and respond to these issues when they look at companies? So a couple of points I'll make there. One is uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, you can't turn the ocean. You have to look out for what is uh, material. So this whole concept of materiality is critical. There are a whole host of issues across ESG and you can tend to get lost in the forest of those issues. Uh, but what you need to try and figure out is really which are the few critical issues that actually make a difference to an industry and to a company. And they will vary from industry to industry. So there is no one size fits all model that you can just deploy and say, now this will throw up the right answers. So for instance, if you're in the IT industry, uh, possibly except with, for the maybe airline travel footprint of consultants, there isn't really a huge sort of greenhouse gas emissions challenge. But the minute you turn to the steel industry or aluminum, that's front and center, perhaps the biggest ESG issue you'll have to tackle. Mm -hmm. So the first point I'd make is don't get worried about uh, the huge sort of uh, ground you might need to cover. Try and pick out what are the most material issues and the good news is a lot of work that's been done, including by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board on what is particularly material for each industry. So you can just pick those out and focus on those. The second point I'd make, uh, and this is something I have to say we've struggled with in India, and that's why I see a big opportunity, including for stewardship organizations in the future, is there is often a relative lack of meaningful data and certainly it's not all available in one place and easily uh, found. Uh, that is why I think the, uh, the business responsibility and sustainability reporting template that the Ministry of Corporate Affairs put out and that SEBI is now uh, on a path to hopefully adopting this year for the top thousand listed companies becomes important because you need companies to report under a particular format. And then you need all the other agencies the proxy advisory firms, the uh, nonprofits, uh, the consultants all jumping in and doing their analysis and producing league tables, uh, assessing how companies are performing and rating them one against the other. So CDP, for instance, has done this recently. And for some of India's largest corporations, they found that a lot of the disclosures were very inadequate and um, very different from the kind of promise that these companies hold out in their public statements and their AGMs. But when you actually scratch the surface and look at their annual reports, you find there's a lot of data that's missing, a lot of disclosures that aren't made, and a lot of needless information is provided, but some of the critical stuff is not there. Uh, a simple example would be, what is your greenhouse gas footprint? Uh, many companies are loath to report that, and some will even try and take shelter under the argument that this is a competitive information. They don't want to give up competitive advantage. This is all uh, usually not very relevant considerations uh, in today's day and age. Uh, you can often just do some math and figure out the kind of technology and therefore the kind of footprint that many of these companies will have, which is what you end up doing as a proxy. But uh, that is a serious problem in India at the moment. But my hope is that that will improve and therefore then give you an ability to integrate many more measures on ESG in your analysis. The last thing I'll say is that uh, there's a lot more effort that's now going into uh, AI and ML, for instance. Uh, there are tools that are being developed that go beyond the normal disclosures that companies will make 
to look at things around uh, media reporting. That's why I talked about the importance of engagement to the media. Uh, that look at uh, you know issues that are popping up in different parts of the world, sometimes in languages that are not English, and therefore you need a tool that will translate it for you. That uh, will often give you some early warning signals on governance challenges in particular that are cropping up. So uh, I would urge that you try and leverage not just the tried and tested tools uh, and frameworks, many of which tend to be backward looking, but also start integrating some of these new tools that give you real time information and probably give you advanced heads up on emerging issues that companies may face around India and, and the world. Uh, so that, that would be my broad advice, but bottom line, don't get worried by uh, the amount of information. Try and focus initially at least on the few handful of issues uh, of which I would put corporate governance squarely as the most important. And then a few critical parameters around E and S and then try and form, form your own uh, assessment framework. Uh, don't just rely on uh, tools that exist from other entities, which as I said, often tend to be backward looking and often not very current with developments. Certainly they would be three months, six months out of date, uh, uh, the frequency with which they often tend to be updated. So if the mainstream investment companies, uh, you know, become as good at ESG as you are, will you use your competitive advantage? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we've, we've created our own proprietary ESG assessment framework. Mm -hmm. And I should share with you that one part of that which we take a lot of pride in is the fact that perhaps the most important element in that is trying to assess promoter intent. Uh, and that I think is in some ways the most critical issue in India in terms of corporate governance. Uh, promoters will often say a lot of the good stuff. Um, it's more difficult to find many of them walking the talk on the same good stuff. And it's even more difficult sometimes to find within their organization, the layers of management and the alignment that would suggest that all this good stuff is something that the whole organization actually is converged upon. So uh, that's something that we certainly spend a lot of time on. So we need a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan for corporate India. <laughs> right. So, you know, we are, we are over time. So I'll uh, try and conclude very quickly. Uh, to two quick questions which have come in, which I want to take, uh, you know, if uh, Shagun will allow me to. Uh, uh, the first is on uh, uh, in, on safety uh, and executive compensation and things like that. So, you know, we have examples of uh, companies abroad which really tie uh, uh, compensation with the safety targets, right? I've heard of a company, a Canadian firm, in which uh, you lose 25% of your bonus if you have a single fatal accident. They're a mining company, right? So there are cases like that, but uh, you know, India is very far away from that. Do you see that sort of a thing coming in, at least in some parts of uh, uh, corporate India today, or uh, is that it, are we very far away from that? No, no, it, it is coming in. In fact, I should share one uh, anecdote from my years with the Tatas. There was one year, relatively recently, when uh, the JRD Tata Quality Values Award, which is the biggest award for corporate quality, brand quality, operational quality in Tata's, it was to be given to one of our largest companies. Um, everything else was fine with the company, except that it had had some fatalities at its plant. And for that one reason alone, it was very clearly decided that they would not be given the award. And that year, the award was in fact not allo allocated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think there are companies where this is taken very seriously. And when you think about it, I mean, the loss of life on your watch is the worst thing that a manager can allow to happen under them. In India, I know the, the price on life is not high, but nevertheless, I think there are a number of companies that take this very seriously. And uh, at least some examples exist that uh, I can speak with personal knowledge of. Okay, last question. Uh, you know, is there any tangible evidence for India that ESG investing outperforms uh, standard, uh, you know, uh, portfolio investing? So I, I gave the example of the MSCI India ESG Leaders Index, and what's interesting there is across time periods, you know, there is no inconsistency. One year, three year, five year, ten year, it's outperformed. Uh, there's some work which the National Stock Exchange has also done with their indices which shows the same thing. Uh, now you have people who will quibble, who will say that you know, some of these companies that feature on the list 
have all kinds of other problems on ESG and they shouldn't be there on the list. And it's a bit unfair to put some of India's largest corporations from the IT sector and from the banking sector as part of these lists. Obviously, they are companies that will do very well and tend to skew the index or that particular indices uh, in their favor. So there is something to be said for those kinds of uh, issues. Uh, but that's exactly the reason why I think we need to now go out in the market, focus much more on the mid-market and on small and medium corporations and demonstrate that this can work. And I think one of the areas where a lot of research overseas suggests it can be made to work over time, and it takes time, it's not going to happen overnight, is through active engagement. Uh, many of these companies don't instantly know what is the right thing that they need to do. They don't instantly know what are the measures that the analyst community is going to be focusing on. Uh, so I think they need handholding, they need support. Maybe some of these stewardship companies that will come up will provide that support. Uh, and over a period of time, you'll start seeing the improvement. And I think the lower hanging fruit, uh, fruit always tends to be initially better disclosure. Uh, just the act of opening up your books, being more transparent, tends to attract attention and gives you a little bit of a bump up in valuation compared to your peers. But the real kicker of all the good stuff that I talked about, you know, lower interest rates, lower insurance premiums, things like that, will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But I think if you have commitment, then over a sustained period, you will see that improvement. And those are the companies that tend to become multi-baggers. And in India, the company I often give as a good example of this is a company like Mariko, which 20 years back had very typical family-linked governance as they professionalized, as they invested in local communities uh, from where they sourced a lot of their natural resource products for like, coconut oil and things like that. Over the years, you know, from a time when they were maybe a tenth of uh, the kind of typical trading multiples that you see with a benchmark company like Hindustan Unilever, now there are quarters when they've in fact overtaken Hindustan Lever on those same parameters. So that's the kind of evolution you will see, but it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mukund. It was great talking to you. We are a little over time. And I must conclude before I go back to uh, Shagun that uh, this is a very important topic for uh, the Institute globally and for CFS Society India. We've recently come out with a uh, um, report on stewardship code. We are in the middle of developing standards, uh, ESG standards for uh, fund houses. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, uh, your company has participated in that process. Uh, and we do a lot of interaction both with regulators worldwide as well as with industry. And we are happy to do more uh, in terms of workshops, awareness building uh, and so on and so forth. It's wonderful uh, that you know, we are having this conversation right now. It's one of many that we have and may, we may come back to you for more help as we uh, you know, uh, keep moving forward on this journey. Thank you, Mukund, once again. Uh, thank you. Thank you.